Good evening. We begin by acknowledging that the Wiseman Art Museum is located on the traditional and contemporary land of the Dakota people. We aspire to honor and respect the indigenous peoples past, present and future by incorporating indigenous knowledge in our work and establishing meaningful reciprocal relationships with carriers of indigenous knowledge and with communities. I'm Katie Covey Spanier, Director of Public Programming and Student Engagement at the Wiseman Art Museum. Tonight, we'll hear Russ White in conversation with Peter Shahalski in honor of the release of Peter Shahalski, We're Working All the Time, a newly published survey of the artist's work distributed by University of Minnesota Press, edited by Dr. Diane Mullen, Senior Curator at WAM, and in anticipation of Peter's mid-career survey at the Wiseman in fall of 2022. The exhibition will be the first to feature work from across Shahalski's extraordinary career. Central to this project, the catalog includes long overdue new scholarship on Shahalski's work and some 250 images. The six texts offer reflections and thoughts from varying perspectives, making the work not only more accessible, but placing Shahalski in the larger international context of contemporary art from the 1980s to today. Copies of the new book are available through the WAM shop. Please contact whamshop at umn.edu to place your order or by stopping into the WAM shop during our new and reduced hours, Thursday through Sunday, noon to 5 p.m. Before we begin, I would like to thank the voters of Minnesota for supporting the operational budget of our museum through funds from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thank you to Wells Fargo Foundation Minnesota also for supporting our operational budget. I'm grateful to my colleagues at the Wiseman Art Museum for helping to make this event happen this evening. As we begin our conversation, we invite you to submit questions and thoughts through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will respond to your questions in the Q&A period after the presentations. You can upvote the questions you're interested in by clicking the like button and the questions with more votes will rise to the top of the queue. We'll, we will be recording tonight's event and it will be posted on the Wiseman's YouTube channel. We have live transcription for tonight's conversation available, but you need to turn it on to see it. Select show subtitles in the drop down menu under the live transcription tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. ASL is provided by American Sign Language Services, Inc. I'm pleased to introduce Russ White. Russ is an artist, designer, and writer living in Minneapolis. Born and raised in the Carolinas in Mississippi, he received a BA in studio art from Davidson College and has maintained a studio in the Casket Arts Building since 2014. White has exhibited his work regionally and nationally and is the recipient of two Minnesota State Arts Board Artist Initiative grants in 2018 and 2020 and works as the editor for mplsart.com and NEMA's annual in-studio magazine. And Peter Shaholski, Born and trained in Poland, Shaholski is a vital presence in the Twin Cities. A professor of design and new media at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and co-director of Artists on the Verge, his art and performance push boundaries, embrace contradictions, and welcome participation. Shahalski's work has been exhibited worldwide at such venues as the International Center of Photography, the New York Expo Film Festival, SIGGRAPH, ISEA Paris, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, the San Jose Mu Museum of Art and Experimented Design in Lisbon, Portugal, and featured in a variety of catalogs and publications. His pieces are in the collections of the Walker Art Center and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and others. And now I'd like to welcome Russ and Peter to the screen. Hello. Hi, Peter. Hey, hey, Russ, how are you? How you doing? <laughs> Very good. Katie, thank good. you for this lovely introduction. Yes, Katie, thank you. And uh, thank you to the Weissman for um, inviting us both to be here. Uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I've been a big fan of Peter's work for a long time. And um, it's always fun to talk to him about his own work. Um, and also thank you to the interpreters for being here. And thank you to everyone uh, at home or wherever you are uh, for being a part of this. I think it's gonna be really interesting. Um, Peter, 
I wanted to start by talking about uh, the title of this book, uh, We Are Working All the Time. It's a retrospective mm -hmm. book of uh, your work over the past several decades. And I got thinking, you know, we just heard a land acknowledgement um, and that's become more and more common. And it got me thinking whether it made sense to also include an acknowledgement of stolen labor, um, and whether that needs to be a part of the conversation, um, not only because the wealth of this country from the very beginning was built on the stolen labor of enslaved peoples, but even to this day, the exploitation of land and labor go hand in hand. And we see it in prison labor, in so-called cheap labor, in uh, the labor of undocumented people, um, you know, wage theft, wage, wage stagnation. It's, you know, it's in the devices that we use, it's in the clothes that we wear, it's in the food that we eat. Um, and I feel like it's so much a part of our culture that it's almost like in the air that we breathe to where like we're proud of it, you know? Like you'll hear people talk about, you know, getting into that hustle or getting into that grind or, you know, I'm being proud that, you know, I'm a workaholic kind of thing. And I've even started to hear people talk about rest as a revolutionary concept. And so all of that to me is wrapped up in this phrase, we are working all the time, but I think that there's like, there's more to it even than that. So what does it mean to you? <clears throat> wow. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful way of just unpacking or exploding these few words because um, it's true. I um, actually, so Russ, it's, a, it's an amazing question to start. I, uh, but I do have to just quickly share um, share screen for a second. I wanted to share with you guys this um, this image. Uh, we are sort of at the Wiseman. Uh, I say sort of because obviously we're virtually there. But this is a photo from 2007 performance at the Wiseman. Chances are, if this was not the COVID time, we uh, perhaps would be in that very space actually uh, conducting this talk. And the reason why I wanted to bring it up. Um, it, because on the right hand side of the screen on the on the stage you actually see uh the posters the very first posters that uh, uh featured that phrase we're working all the time being printed as part of this uh performance or a parallel if you will to everything else that is happening on the stage it was a, a very simple uh, idea at the time and i wanted to kind of uh, draw the attention to different kinds of labors um before I even came up with this poster, um, this typographic treatment, uh, you know, I was developing this uh, performance event, uh, but I wanted a, a, a different kind of labor to parallel this our artistic labor, if you will. And so the idea of just some kind of manual labor happening led me to realizing that the labor would be the printing and that the content of the printing would be kind of self-referential, acknowledging its own labor. You know, we are working all the time was sort of a, a kind of a, a loop that was happening in that space. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now that the this is the title of the book and the exhibition, I thought it would be kind of uh, nice to just acknowledge this uh, loop in time. So I'm gonna get out of this um, share right now. And um, let's see. Um, here, um, the posters, I've got this here. Right. So everyone can see that this was a series of posters over, I think you did one every year. Is that right? It wasn't really a, a timed uh, timed thing like this. Uh, I, in that layout, I don't see the original one. But um, mm -hmm. to me, all of this is still the same poster. It sort of mutates. It, it takes a slightly different form depending on the circumstances. But ever uh, since that first event took place and this idea of this poster acknowledging labor in its um, kind of uh, extensive amorphous definition um, became part of the at least this uh, performative practice over the years. So many of my uh, large scale public space performances are indeed accompanied by a printing of the new sort of um, face, new iteration of this of this poster. Um, and I'm still actually just a couple of days ago, I was working out the, the new typographic treatment because the book, there's a special edition of this book that came from the printer with a, a blank cover and a brand new 
uh, treatment of this design will be screen printed on a handful of these objects. So, mm -hmm. so even just a couple of days ago, I was already uh, kind of mulling through this uh, uh, through this set of letters yet again. Um, <laughs> So this, I mean, I guess the fact that this, uh, you know, we're looking at different versions, but um, I feel like this work continues, so to speak. Um, well, it just, do you see it yeah. primarily as a criticism of that sort of we are working all the time culture or like there's something about the exclamation point to me that makes it a celebration? Yeah. Um, well, it's both. It's both. It's all of these things. I mean, that's why I liked your your amazing unpacking of the phrase, uh, bringing this this really rich and very complex set of ideas in play. Um, there is something about the the work, or maybe just I would say maybe general uh, in general language of art that actually um, has the capacity to contain to contain these um, sometimes wildly. Uh, oppositional viewpoints. Uh, it leaves the sort of uh, openings for different kind of audiences, different readings. They're specific to a particular context, not just geographically, but in time. They resonate in different ways, depending on the kind of baggage you bring to that experience. And that phrase and, and that, uh, that line of thinking, and then by extension, this larger framework of the labor camp has all of those um, complexity somehow encapsulated in it. You know, I'd, I'd say mm -hmm. that, you know, my own sort of uh, uh, rethinking of that of that particular design and and being, I don't know, in a way, consumed by it even to this day, um, it's just maybe one of the the acknowledgement of only one tiny uh, layer of uh, of thinking involved in this uh, really simple gesture which is to say i think as artists we really do work all the time too you know and this is in addition to all these other amazingly complex political social historical issues um you're awake you're if you're not actually making the thing you're thinking about making the thing and and or talking to somebody about the thing and when you fall asleep you dream about it and you wake up with a you know new project in mind and you continue work i mean you know and I mean, that I know. was my response think... to it as an artist was that like, oh no, this is, that's that's so true for my own practice and that I, you know, asked my wife, I won't shut up about all of my brilliant ideas because it just, it just right. keeps going. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, so and rest uh, is work and work is rest. Yeah, so. and on top of all of this, there are so many different kinds of labors, right, that we need to acknowledge. And um, I mean, I, I, I think, um, yeah, and so so it, it, I I don't know. I think I couldn't do a better job of what you did in terms of uh, uh, sort of like pointing at the at the variety of directions in which that that that, sin, that simple sentiment could be uh, could be taken. But well, uh, it's all of those things. You just mentioned labor camp, so just to mm -hmm. sort of back up and I guess give everyone uh, some context, like when did the concept of labor camp start, or the name, or you know. What's the what's the history of labor camp as a project? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, there is a uh, there is sort of a um, history, but I would say that there's mainly uh, a kind of uh, trail of its own uh, evolutions of this idea or these uh, this way of thinking. I use the word framework for labor camp because it seems the most sort of I don't know flexible and 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 maybe. Um, malleable it, it can mean a lot of different things because sometimes it really is a mindset for me other times it's actually acknowledging the the history of the idea or mm -hmm. contemporary uh uh presence of the of that phenomenon uh other times it's uh um just that that endless labor that we were just talking about right i mean it all it is all of those things but and I, my own thinking about this really had changed over the over the over the years. I think the first time I used the phrase was probably in the late '90s, and initially I was using that phrase uh, mainly in relation to sound works uh, that I was uh, pursuing in, at that time, and maybe a, another decade or so. Actually, to this day. Um, um, but sound works uh, specifically that were. Um, a device or, or a language or a structure that I was uh, utilizing to work my way through history. And um, 
and the reason why that work felt important to me because um, I and I still am a firm believer of um, utilizing uh, historical frameworks and concepts to understand or inform our contemporary uh, circumstances. And you know, we can talk about different ways that that uh, that kind of manifest itself in the work, but that was uh, part of that, that initial moment was to say, that's hard work too. There's a lot of work involved in making that effort to really um, try to figure out, make sense of the world. And that that is one of the biggest sort of endless labors that I feel, not just as artists we uh, uh, focus on or pursue, but I think all of us to an extent, uh, uh, we're all trying to kind of make sense of what's going on. And um, true, yeah. Uh, God it's knows the last uh, the last year gave us plenty of reasons to really think about that. Last four years, last four hundred years. Correct. Um, it seems like it, it, there's also a sense of collectivity involved mm. because it's not, you know, it's a camp. You're, there's it's sort of a group. Mm. Of people. And so I was curious if everything that you do is like a labor camp joint, or <laughs> you ever are you ever like, nope, this is just for like Peter's going to paint a landscape today, and this is just for Peter, you know? Wow. Um, I yeah, there is a sense. So one of the I would say one of the points of value in all this is acknowledging uh, a collectivity of that experience. No question. Um, so whether that's uh, me working alongside somebody else and uh, in, the, in the show and in the book, you will see a lot of work that is deeply collaborative. Um, uh, lots of uh, I, I have been fortunate to work with so many wonderful artists over the years, um, artists, collectives, students, friends, uh, uh, colleagues, um, family. Uh, you know, I would say it would be I would be hard pressed finding uh, uh, a, a significant amount of projects that I could say it's just me. You know. Um, well, and even I, with the the COVID report project, I mean, it getting shared, and then I think the wheat pasting and sort totally. of totally, yeah, the the collective the sort of aspects of that work manifested itself in um, all sorts of unusual ways as the project continued to evolve. But you know, just going back uh, for a second to this collectiveness of um, of the labor camp, I really do love the fact that. Um, since so much of my work since the since uh, late '90s had been one way or the other kind of considered under the umbrella of the of the labor camp framework, that m myself as a as an artist get kind of diluted uh, in this um, in this concept. Um, for a lot of people, labor camp is absolutely a collective; that it's not an individual person, and you know, in many cases, that is true. Um, with the COVID reports popping up in different cities on the street, I love the fact that for a lot of people, I am actually a Baltimore artist or the labor camp is a, is a Philadelphia collective or we're in Brooklyn or, you know, in different cities. I, I love thinking about this, this dissolving of uh, the artist as the, as the kind of um, uh, the hand that turns the the ordinary objects in, into extraordinary objects, right. or that um, the preciousness of I don't know uh, institutional art space is the thing that uh, brings the value to the uh, to the experience. And I love the fact that all of these things get dissolved. And um, to be honest, you know, when Diane um, first approached me with the uh, with this uh, idea of the show i think one of the things that i said to her is i i don't know if i have enough stuff to put in the museum because um because so much of my practice was really about experience or or, or space and event uh things that actually actively were questioning the preciousness of objects of course mm -hmm. After a closer look, it turned out that there is a lot of objects involved, whether they're like detritus of the events or um, or objects constructed in their own right. Um, they definitely turn out to be enough to not just uh, uh, populate the book, but populate the space of the of the exhibition as well. What was interesting in the book, um, Diane talks about um, how whenever you've been approached to uh, show older work, you've always either just declined outright 
or tried to find a way to sort of reinvent it to make it responsive to that new context, to that new space, that yeah, new time, sure. and how that actually made it uh, difficult to put a retrospective book and, and eventually exhibition together. And I'm wondering, like, what was for you when you approached this? Did you have a, a concept around retrospective of what you wanted this to be or what you wanted to learn by doing this? And mm. was it difficult to, you know, edit things down and say, well, this makes sense in a book or this doesn't make sense in a book? And then, you know, when you went through all this old work, did you like discover new things? Like, oh, I forgot I made this, you know? Hmm. Yeah, lots of interesting points. Uh, I, I guess, um, well, first of all, um, I still don't refer to this as a retrospective. Um, I, uh, we, we've agreed on the term uh, survey exhibition. <laughs> okay, okay, noted. <laughs> and, and the reason for that, and well, I, maybe not a reason, but there was an aspect to this discussion of this term that had to do with this. Um, I think Diane was really one of the people that kind of pointed it out to me and suggested that perhaps my experience way back uh, many years ago back in Poland where I worked on archaeological digs as a person who drew the maps of the uh, various rock formations or the way the artifacts were found under the layers of dirt that was taken uh, that that experience there was something really truly uh, uh, formative about those experiences. And I, I think I think she's spot on about this because the more I kept thinking about it, the more I realized that there was more and more um, in it, including the very simple fact of digging in the dirt mm -hmm. as a way of traveling back in time. I mean, it seems like an obvious observation, but um, considering, you know, looking back at the number of years of, of work, um, I can see how so much of it really is literally about that, or maybe a kind of reenactment of that of that process by by other means. Um, so the survey had something to do with the moment where before the dig, the archaeological dig happens, and we kind of uh, sweep the area and we pick up bits and pieces of 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 stuff that's not rocks. Um, and then the archaeologists can analyze this and decide where it's important to dig, because based on this, these tiny elements are, are fragments of something broken, stuff that may be a plowshare picked up uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the process of, of working the fields, uh, reveal the signal of something that was still there deeper under the layers of, uh, of, of dirt. So that survey, the moment of surveying of the land, scraping for these um, bits and pieces of, of information. To me, like when, when we started talking about that, that was the metaphor that made sense, that in fact, we're gonna scrape the, the last say three decades and pick up these bits and pieces, fragments of, of stuff that sure. perhaps signals something bigger. And well, you've talked about this, um, all of your past work is sort of being a prelude to like preparation for the COVID report project. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. that something that you noticed in, in sort of doing this survey and doing this digging or did it manifest itself more in the, like, you know, drawing every single day? Yeah, well, that too, um, you know, talk about working all the time. I mean, I know. <laughs> the last eight months of working on this, uh, on the COVID series was, uh, was, yeah, I don't know if that was not a, a kind of self-imposed labor camp. It was certainly some kind of monastic, uh, meditative experience that um, through work, you know, through uh, through labor, both physically and immaterially um, processing the information. Um, that was so 200, think, yeah. 225 days? Yeah, 225 yeah. days. I don't know, it doesn't sound like all that much when you say it like, like this, but it's it really was a good amount of time. Um, eight months, uh, you know, it's like a, a little more, I mean, it's more than half a year. Um, anyway, the, uh, I think having gone through the process of um, revisiting all these old projects, um, trying to understand the continuity of ideas, um, maybe uh, the way that various gestures performed you know, 20 years ago actually still resonate in some ways uh, today, 
it must have had an impact and must have informed my own thinking about what I was doing with this uh, sort of most recent project, right? And so when I said to, to I, th I don't know if I was talking to you or, or I, I bring it up every now and then because it really feels uh, that so many of those moments from the past really deeply informed my own uh, uh way of being present in this moment and uh, through the not just the, uh, the the pandemic experience but the waning uh, months of the regime you know which the combination of those two things uh, felt at the same time overwhelming but weirdly familiar and um, and clear to me you know and I, I i felt i felt like i understood what was happening and i understood what i needed to do in that moment um and that feeling must have been informed by my experiences with all these other projects maybe not even just projects but actually for example having uh had uh a number of uh you know growing up in a um in an oppressive under oppressive system or realizing that um, communist Poland and capitalist uh, America in the 21st century or the late 20th century are both actually oppressive systems just uh, dressed in slightly different um, outfits and utilizing different tools of oppression. Um, like those are, those are not, not just things uh, that one or that I would read in a book about, but those were like lived experiences, things that we do carry in our in our bodies, whether we like it or not. Um, that's the kind of preparation that I think I I really realized was was there all along. And I'm not even talking about you know my passion for poster uh, and understanding of poster as a, a way of thinking, way of processing um, information poster as a as a unique language uh, as a unique language that um, operates in public space you know in the space of the street where um, where at least theoretically uh, the dynamic of democracy unfolds right and um, those things make a lot of sense to me and, and kind of congealed very very quickly in the um, through this project do you see? I wanted to talk to you about posters. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like medium is very important. You know, looking through the book, there's, you know, every medium imagined, you've got performance, you've got installation, you've got printmaking, you've got, you know, audio recordings, you've got websites. You, you use your classroom as a medium uh, in many cases. Um, and for this, for the COVID project, you kind of boiled it down to ink, paper, and Instagram. And um, ink, paper, and Instagram. I like it. Yeah. And you've kind of just gone, you know, the, the book starts with posters, and you can see posters as being a big part of your early work. And then, you know, this was the form that you chose for this project. So I was curious um, to hear, you know, a little bit more specifically from you about posters, but also. You know, I've been trying to think about like, well, you know, when I think of propaganda posters, I think of, you know, uh, Soviet era sort of state sponsored things. And then when I think of posters in America, generally they're sort of attacking that they're sort of um, agitprop in that regard. But the capitalist version is advertising. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's a fair parallel that like yeah. we're bombarded? You can, make you can absolutely make that point. Yeah. Yeah. So what what is the what's the power of the poster for you? Mm. Well, you know, like I said, I, I to, in many ways, well, yeah, we could approach this from various angles. I already kind of outlined a couple of them, but I would also say that um, on a, a kind of f fundamental level, um, one of the things that I always sort of gravitated to or understood in 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 some way it was the relation the, the simultaneous. Uh, uh text and image uh dynamic right the two sort of languages operating in a way that a, a new quality emerges right this is something that i've always been attracted to and 
intrigued by and focused and explored in in different ways. I remember when we were talking about about uh, some of the projects uh, when you were writing the text for the McKnight grant. Uh, you pointed out how text is such a, a through line in a lot of the work, and I remember thinking, "Huh, that just seems so obvious." I, and, and I never really think about about that. That is text. The text is present in like almost everything I do. I mean, it's very rare where there's just image uh, operating. And I think that does have something to do with this, with this um, kind of initial passion for for poster design from you know many decades ago. And uh, yeah, so so even when I would, for example, work with sound and had a spoken word or archival recording of some kind of speech. Uh, be woven in with uh, with the sonic um, matter, I would say that it, for me, it was kind of a poster. It's just instead of um, using the visual language, it was using sonic language. Um, in fact, there is a project. So posters um, and leaflets are my like two favorite um, printed matter formats. Uh, you know, I've, I've designed a lot of leaflets over the years. Sometimes I just throw them at people. Other times there were devices that were built to slowly distribute leaflets in public spaces. Mm. I still wanna do a proper airplane drop. I don't know when that's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen sooner or later. Um, so it, it is, there is something about the, uh, the, the, specifics of the of the format that already comes with uh, a, a very specific historical cultural uh, or utilitarian context uh, I think of leaflets as the best sort of um, example of how I mean they are being continually used as in theater of operations uh, around the world you know thousands and thousands of small pieces of paper with crudely drawn graphics uh, are being thrown on people all the time, um, much uh, like bombs. In fact, a lot of leaflets uh, have pictures of the bombs and they simply say, this could have been a real bomb, mm. flee immediately and save your life. You know, this is literally direct language of like coalition forces leaflets that we would be dropping in Afghanistan or in Iraq. Um, so I just the specific proportions of the piece of paper uh, already to me indicates that uh, kind of crudeness or, or corruption of, uh, of the messaging. And then that becomes an opportunity for me to uh, dislodge it or redirect it. But the reason why I'm bringing up leaflets is because I actually did a project that used the texts from coalition forces leaflets, but turned them into one minute long sound pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you know, just to further illustrate the point that I, I really do think, even when it's a, a sound piece, that to me, um, it's it's still a, a kind of a similar situation that there's one language and then there's another language and the two put together produce something unlike anything else. There's a lot of that thinking in, um, in my work, um, both formally and intellectually in a way that um, ideas are being juxtaposed or butted up against each other in a way that some on one hand they seem to read in this way but on the other hand if you look at or pursue them with a more critical mind or pay attention to the nuances of the context then a different um, kind of reading or interpretation can emerge much like your original reading of the simple phrase we're working all the time Right. There's sort of a, a built in ambiguity about it. And I mean, I've, you know, I've thought about this in terms of um, satire as well. I mean, I think we all bring our own uh, biases and sort of um, assumptions to everything that we see. And so, you know, when I see your work, I, I assume, oh, yeah, you know, he and I are of a like mind. So um, therefore, uh, I get the joke, you know, right. Do you ever worry that the joke is not being gotten. Uh, I'm sure it happens all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is this the moment where I get to bring up the my favorite phrase about the fear of handling shit? Uh, maybe. Uh, you know the the. I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but oh, it well, comes up in, in talks and conversations all the time. Fear of handling shit is a luxury a sewerman cannot afford. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I really think about this phrase in relation to 
art making, you know, and um, so much of it uh, may very well be a situation where we are handling something that is super challenging, that is difficult, um, that can be misinterpreted, will be misinterpreted all the time, right? Um, but those are not the reasons not to do, not to pursue these subjects. Those are precisely the reason reasons to pursue this these subjects and mm -hmm. you know this is one of those moments where we, we enter the territory of talking about politics or political art or the kind of directness and crudeness of the language of propaganda and in in how many ways uh or in how in some ways uh at least from the COVID series and some of the works in the past the what i do does sort of hint at that um at that crudeness or you uh signals that language uh, I do sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a kind of a defensive posture or not, but I really um, very much uh, want to underscore that I, despite the fact that so much of my work feels deeply political, uh, I don't think about it in those terms. Uh, I don't think of it as political work. I think of it as work about politics. Um, about politics the way that you know a landscape painter looks at the landscape um and your to your earlier question about the medium or the importance of the medium you know why posters why performance why a sound project um uh the language of poster comes very quickly as the appropriate medium or as the appropriate language to make artwork about politics because it immediately shares that space. It, uh, it places the work in the context of that public space that we were, we were talking about earlier. You know, I, I, I can't, even if with these drawings that we, you know, I just made the drawings here at the desk that I'm sitting at, we would photograph it on the porch upstairs on the, uh, you know, my daughter would hold the, uh, the drawings. Um, I still felt that the graphic language that I was utilizing was immediately uh, uh, kind of placing the experience of these images by implication in some kind of public space, whether that's the mm -hmm. actual kind of maybe naively considered uh, social media sphere as a public space, or just the, all the implications, the notions of where the posters go, what happens with the posters. You know, I loved it when people were uh, talking about these drawings and referred to them as prints, you know, when uh, many months before they actually became prints. Mm -hmm. And it only happened because the, the drawings looked like they were posters, as if there was a printed uh uh, printed matter and then people would immediately see this daily drawing and say how do I get the prints I want to get the prints um, and then I would have to say well that's just the drawing I made right. you know this morning and and then tomorrow I'm going to make a different one there's no even if I wanted to print these things there just was not enough time in the day to, <laughs> to print them um, there was barely enough time to you know make a drawing have you kept up with the drawing now that um no <laughs> no you taking a break no the the end of the project was the end of the project and um uh you know we can talk about that there's reasons for it to that that i considered that the project would end there but um no i i, I have been super busy with the project in by other means you know like i said there the drawings had had become prints the prints that are part of the exhibitions but also prints that are now available to folks individually and i love seeing the prints in people's homes it really is just like one of my favorite things right now is to see folks posting pictures sometimes holding the pictures of the printed posters in their homes the way it all sort of started on in our home with ava holding the the, the drawings on the porch that that sort of circularity of that um you know, is yet another articulation of this notion that is very valuable to me, which is that um, the ownership of that work um, in my sort of, from my vantage point had, uh, had transferred a long time ago from me just making some drawings to me tending to this weird experience, this garden that lasted several months to folks just taking, um, taking all this material and, and 
finding some use for it, using it, um, you know, the, in a kind of um, just as a utility of sorts. I mean, I, I've uh, engaged in so many conversations with, with people who, um, you know, would open up and speak to, to me about just how important it was to, I don't know, uh, see that somebody was feeling sim similarly to them in that really complex moment or that they were um, not alone in their anger about something that was ha that just happened yesterday or was happening last week um, or just finding it useful to unpack process try to figure out try to understand what was really happening um, well, so I yeah I, I, I project right I mean that it, it you weren't engaging in you know, there was several days, you know, lots of them where it was a direct criticism of an action that was taken or a, a ridiculous phrase that was spoken or a tragedy that occurred or something. But there were also these sort of interstitials that were just sort of about the emotional truth of what we were all going through, like, you know, until hugs and that's just a person looking at a window alone or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the person falling asleep and their pillow is on fire, you know, or um, on a boat in the middle of a, a lake of fire kind of thing is really mm -hmm. powerful images that underscore, <clears throat> I think that the ambiguity, but also just the, the humanity of this, these massive crises that we're going through. And then to have each of those posters, each of those drawings then documented and you, you almost, it kind of faded out, but to see, you know, your sunroom or whatever, room it was and your daughter holding it, it gave that little, that human connection, that domesticity yeah. uh, that really underscored the fact that we were all going through this in our own lives, in our own spaces. Right. Uh, kind of together, you know, together apart or whatever. Together alone, right. <laughs> alone together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it was powerful. I was curious if you maintained, I know that, you know, in your stories, Instagram stories, you were doing documentation on the process of the ideation. Um, I'm sure you still have a stack of those note cards and I'm wondering if you, do you maintain a sketchbook practice? Do you, do you hmm. draw a doodle? I mean, is that? Yeah, interesting question. There's a, uh, I don't know if it's a, well, hold on a second. Oh, now it is a studio, is it? Oh, totally. Um, I don't know if it's a sketchbook practice, but I do have these, I use these small uh, notebooks that are just full of um, sometimes, I guess mostly notes, some sketching. But I have a lot of these and, you know, I, back in the days when we used to go places, I would just carry those with me um, and collect that, those bits and pieces of information. Now it's maybe more just here or in the studio. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know if it's a, if it's a regimen in, in that way, you know, you pointed out earlier that there are so many different media and, and different kind of uh, processes that you can see in the book and, and then eventually in the exhibition. It's true. I, I, on a project by project basis, uh, my attitude about medium or material changes. And so they will be very sort of wildly um, diverse in that way. Um, this one project, this last one, the COVID report project, took that form uh, and so it became its language and and I feel it was a um, important uh, kind of process in which uh, that project sort of manifested itself in that specific way formally. Um, but, you know, it's not a reflection of my entire art practice. It was everything I did during those eight months because the project was absolutely all consuming and and thank God in some ways that it was because it was just such a crazy crazy time uh, where having that continuity focus having that meditative space either just sitting here in in silence or uh, ult ultimately you know choosing some uh, some music. I loved listening to Arvo Part uh, when making a lot of these drawings. Um, that became almost like a, a, a kind of a, I hate the word performative in that sense, but um, 
but it was like a performance, uh, like an extreme duration performance, you know, to use the, the language that maybe connects it to earlier work, these uh, nine hour uh, dusk to dawn performances that were part of uh, several Northern Spark um, events. That language of, of uh, duration and, and the labor extended to execute something that just through sheer duration already speaks to or becomes a kind of a testimony to that uh, labor aspect of it. Those are like elements that were very present in this work too, but ultimately produced something that felt very, very different formally um, from mm -hmm. those uh, events. That's because the circumstances, the site specificity, the time specificity demanded something different. So that chapter is closed. This project is, uh, is done. And, you know, of course, there's going to be something else that will come up um, that will maybe look like uh, something that continues with the series or maybe not. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I imagine it depends on venue and right, when we all right. get the shot in the arm and when we can get back together and when life can move on. Uh, Absolutely. Back to whatever degree of normalcy. I was curious um, if you felt like that project took a toll on you in terms of hmm. focusing every single day. I mean, like I went back through and, and looked at the entire project and it's intense, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, it is not only the the subject matter, but also the scale of work. Hmm. Um, just as someone who draws, like I know the amount of work that goes into doing something, you know, that size every right. single day. And not only that, but every single one is absolutely brilliant. and. Um, and beautiful and there's different styles and different things. But the thing that really hit me the most was the numbers because, you know, early on you started documenting the numbers and I've got one here. Um, let's see. Um, this one. Mm -hmm. So this is March 31st and um, you were uh, documenting numbers of different uh, death totals in different countries, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, the one uh, second from the right was the United States at 3,173 people yeah. died. And now we're at, I think I looked and it was like 460,000, um, you know, and it's just one out of a thousand Americans has died because of this disease. Yeah. Um, and so I was curious if you felt like the project was a way, you mentioned it being kind of meditative. Do you feel like it was a, like your obligation to kind of check those numbers and be present with this crisis and, and you know, literally report on it to the rest of us? Yeah, I think that's, that's why these ended up being, uh, I ended up referring to them as reports because that was absolutely one way of grounding these images in that reality. Um, that, that they were responding to. And um, yeah, just a, I have this board in the, in the studio with, uh, it's one of those like lunchtime uh, blackboards when you stick little plastic letters and uh, there's a phrase on this, uh, on one, among other phrases that says, to record is to serve. And there is an element of, um, well, there's lots there, but I will say that the idea of uh, of just keeping a record um, seemed important uh, to me at the time and still does. Uh, I think that I remember reading some text some some maybe years ago. Uh, some historians were talking about uh, through one of the crises. I'm not really sure. Maybe it had to do with the Iraq war. Uh, they were talking about the need for people to keep journals and writing things down because um, uh, that the narratives or the sum total of the narratives as they are uh, uh, lived experiences of, you know, ordinary people like you and I um, will then become a historical material uh, that will offer a valid alternative to, you know, these artificial narratives that are produced by the state or whatever apparatus is uh, attempting to control every aspect of our life. And we certainly have experienced profound effects of this 
over the last four years and and more obviously but the last four years were so perverse that we all were sort of like um taken aback by the sheer absurdity and audacity of it right that, that how could this possibly be be happening here like this is not this is like north korea or something uh material um not not in the united states the beacon of of freedom and democracy in the in the world um but sadly uh we are uh we are experiencing the effects of that of that endless and relentless manipulation of everything that uh, happens now in our history and by default our future too you know pre being predestined for something to to happen so there's uh the need to record and i so the the need to record facts of the situation uh led me to date and and the kind of the counting or accounting of um uh, that i sort of found myself keeping uh and at the same time, offering this other language, this other kind of journalistic reflection uh, processed already through my own baggage of my life, my experiences, um, everything that I engaged in or learned from the multitude of conversations with, with folks online. And, um, you know, that, that language offers, speaks, speaks in a very different way and offers both the complexity and directness directness sort of at the same time right for some a lot of these messages will stay on the surface for others you know with a little bit of work with a little bit of patience um we can really uh connect to some deeper layers well i'm really looking forward to getting my copy of uh that book you got two books going um yeah. <laughs> because i think i will be sort of a you know a log of everything and going back through um you know there were specific instances where it's like oh my god yes i remember that or you know um just to to help you know it's like how you remember your own life better if you have photographs of it you know mm -hmm. um but i was curious you know i've seen instagram specifically social media in general but instagram specifically um kind of evolve over this past year into something that was a little bit more uh, of an activist space, a little bit more uh, utilitarian, where there's, you know, especially since the murder of George Floyd and the uprising, I've seen a lot more usage of that platform for sharing, um, you know, community needs or uh, you know, calls for action or uh, mutual aid requests or anything like that. And at the same time, I've also seen it used, you know, for for massive disinformation. Um, so I was curious if you had any reservations about using that platform, um, given that it's kind of a, a hellhole of you know of narcissistic like, yeah. obsession. Um, at the same time as being a channel of communication, um, and what parameters you felt like, cause you didn't, you kind of focused in this labor camps channel. It was like a broadcast channel. Mm -hmm. It sort of became that for sure. Yeah. Huh. I mean, yeah, of course it's, it's, it's a, a, a space that's just fraught with, with complexity and, 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 and problems mm -hmm. like any other, like any other space really. Um, but, um, so, so I really liked it when you said, you know, um, paper ink and instagram as though they were kind of just the material and and mm -hmm. it's true in some ways it became kind of a, a rudimentary component of this process um i mean there's no doubt in my mind that i would not have sustained this project beyond maybe the initial what i seven sheets of paper that i happened to have in the basement under on basement under lockdown when i first started making these drawings i wouldn't have sustained it past that if it weren't for the fact that just somehow I decided to post that first one on Instagram and, and Facebook mm -hmm. and instantly engaged in a conversation with folks who um, just felt some kind of connection happen with this initial drawing and certainly the second, third. And um, by the time I reached that seven drawing, it was just sort of, um, inevitable that i would have to make more i just didn't quite know how many more and um little did you know yeah little very little um 
No, I had no no sense whatsoever of the of the duration or or even the direction, to be honest. But partly because none of us did in the, at that time. We had no idea what we were in what what we had in store for us. Um, except it felt uh, scary and heavy, and immediately uh, forced us all to confront all sorts of demons and um you know from from just our own mortality to to the corruption of the system to the inherent inequities uh i think some, suddenly everything became just a little sharper maybe the way that you know um in a moment of 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 fear and or panic horror the adrenaline sort of pumps through your body and alters entirely your perception of everything that happens there's something to be said about that shared experience um, that I think was a little bit like that, where we all kind of took a different, um, different take on where we found ourselves. Well, it was, yes, absolutely. And it was amazing to watch, you know, because we are all stuck inside basically into, you know, spending a lot of time on our phones and every day, you know, what, is he going to do another one? Oh, here he comes. Oh, we got one, you know, to, to follow along and have that. And I remember, I think it was in April, um, I sent you a DM that was like, this is amazing. By all means, don't stop. But also, if you need to stop, please stop. Yeah, like, I do remember that. Too. Because I was, I felt like as an audience member, I don't want to, you know, I want to be like cheering you on, but I don't want to be encouraging, you know, sort of a, an abusive relationship where <laughs> you feel like you owe me something. And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was curious, this is a question I've had about artists, you know, for a while now is, what do you think as an artist your responsibility is to your audience? Yeah, that's a big one. And um, I do remember very clearly that exchange that we had, but I, I also want to say that, um, uh, you know, our exchange was just part of like a, a whole slew of other, of other conversations. Yeah. And people would say things like, please, you know, uh, do not stop. There's, there's no, you can't, you know, I, I'm, I'm relying on this somehow. And, you know, I, I'm sort of uh, uh, maybe speaking of it in, with a little bit of levity right now, but, you know, it didn't feel like that in the moment at all. In fact, it felt very genuine and, um, intimate almost you know in the way that these these connections were uh were sort of propagating or, or expanding almost exponentially the longer the project lasted the more of those uh of those engagements had, had take were taking place and you know earlier you were talking about the book as the kind of um recounting of the time or record of the time right and um i i i understand that that is sort of by default going to be the case, right? It's a timeline uh, with all this sort of information recorded in this particular way. Um, but it did become a book uh, largely because of these conversations that were happening with people, uh, sometimes just directly in the comments on the, Im on the images and sometimes in the direct messages or personal messages behind the, the sort of surface of the social media where actually a number of people said, listen, um, you know, and this, this is sort of paraphrasing this, but somebody would say, my daughter is too young to understand this right now, but I want to be able someday to uh, walk her through this experience that we actually uh, shared in that, uh, in her early childhood, right? And this is, this is a, an actual sort of uh, uh, message that a complete stranger would share with me. And then somebody else would say something almost exactly the same, right? And, and at that point, I was just, um, realizing that I can't not do it. It has to be, it has to become a thing, right? And so when you, when you ask about the relationship with the audience, I think it's a, I think it's a hugely important question. Uh, and one that I, again is one of those through lines that I can, uh, you know, we can walk through all these projects in the book um, and I can, uh, I can point out to you particular moments where that relationship um, sort of came to the surface as one of the more important uh, aspects of the work from all the 
work that I've done that I've done for internet uh, interactive work in the 90s early 2000s um, that really thrived in that uh, relationship with the other person on the other side of the screen um, how do you acknowledge how do you build a space or work that acknowledges that space and negotiates the space between those um, in individuals involved mm -hmm. um, I think of uh, all of this as a kind of social act. It, it presupposes the, the uh, a kind of community that exists uh, within or around the work sometimes. And again, number of projects manifested it differently. And this current one um, absolutely embraced that. Um, I, um, and I said this number of times now when, when I talk about this work is that uh, somewhere halfway into it, I realized that it wasn't just about me making the drawings. It was me maintaining this service because people were waiting for uh, for it. You know, they were they were expecting it. It was important. It had a role uh, in that daily experience in the processing of what was happening around us. And I, um, you know, I I would it would be clear to me. It would be communicated to me. And once you know. You can't go back, right? Um, I can't undo it in my head. I know that that's how it is. And I don't know if it's responsibility to my audience necessarily, but I think there's something deeper. There's a responsibility to just um, each other, to another human being. And uh, I think that, you know, like it or not, we are in that, in that vulnerable space that we, that we share. And sometimes um, it's just, it's just not something that we can ignore or choose not to pursue. I, you know, when I um, when I talk to students about responsibility, I sometimes uh, share this uh, text by Carol Carol Becker, "Social Responsibility and the Place of the Artist in Society," a great essay from the '90s. At the very end of this essay, if you don't mind, I'm going to just read this last paragraph. This is in the 90s, so it's sort of uh, uh, acknowledging a different moment of crisis, uh, AIDS and um, Reagan's era. Um, Artists in this country now appear to be refusing the place of isolation and marginality they have been given and which they themselves romantically have often confused with freedom. It is time for artists to challenge that which they cannot live and to bring into view that which they refuse to live without. This task of confronting contradictions in all forms, at all levels, of crossing beyond the parameters of the art world to do so, is not the work of all artists, uh, is not the work all artists will have the inclination to choose. It need not be understood so much as responsibility um, any more than the responsibility which we all must assume for securing the survival of this planet, but rather a possibility which I personally hope many will embrace. So even though the whole essay is uh, um, kind of ostensibly unpacking the idea of our responsibility within you know, society, within culture, um, at, the, at the end, it really is uh, understanding that possibility, right? And once we understand that possibility, it becomes the motivation or the, the, the reason behind why uh, it's a little easier to find it. It's a little easier to understand it. And maybe that is the very definition of responsibility. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I choose to think about it as um, a sense of care, generosity, empathy, really. Um, I think that those are, those are the... Um, uh, the ways I would describe that shared relationship that we do with each other through work, through artwork. And if we can learn from that and begin to rebuild a kind of a, a healthier, a more deeply rooted uh, in empathy relationship with each other, I think we can move forward from the, the wreckage that, that we're in right now. Well, I mean, that's, yes, that's lovely. And I think it's a testament to the quality of your work and your clarity of vision that you were able to cultivate that kind of community and, and have that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in the spirit of being responsive to our audience, um, I thought maybe we should take some questions. Yeah, um, so the top question is from an anonymous attendee uh saying art often reflects a shared human experience 
but there's frequently some space between subject creation and sharing. What was different about making, sharing, and getting feedback on a daily basis about an ongoing worldwide collective trauma with no known end? Hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the work that is part of the the, the we're working all the time book um, and the Wiseman exhibition. Uh, does acknowledge what I would call these extreme historical phenomena, uh, things that happened in the past that resonate through time and impact our reality to this day. Um, working on the COVID project was a unique situation where I was able to respond to undeniably an extreme historical phenomenon that we were living in in that moment. Um, so suddenly the luxury of the the hindsight or or the the look the distance that history often provides where we can see the kind of uh the big gestures the big ideas come to focus a little more easily because of the distance um in this situation um you know the magnitude the scale of everything that was happening was such that it, it really was this is one of the reasons why it was so disorienting it continues to be disorienting in, in some ways add to it the layer upon layer of, of falsehood, lies, overt manipulation uh, and falsification of, of information that we were, uh, we were being fed. And, you know, we were all suddenly in this um, uprooted or disconnected floating, uh, certainly ungrounded space. So this, this felt alone felt for it super different and um and you know you were asking earlier about the toll that it took i think that that was one of the things that really took the biggest toll on me is the fact that um i think much like everybody else i too was just uh desperate for some sense of uh clarity in what was happening and and also realizing just how impossible it really was at this point you know if if the truth itself is eliminated, eliminated from equation, how could we possibly move forward on anything, any subject? How do you know, you know, whose truth, uh, alternative facts? I mean, just, it seems absolutely um, mind bending that the, the, the kind of circumstances that we were all in. Um, so in that, um, those individual relationships that I was talking about, these endless dialogues were absolutely providing a some kind of either either kind of uh friction that allows me to understand what i'm kind of uh orienting myself in relation to or just something to hold on to something that would anchor me in my own thinking about the work so you know i said that the the act of actually processing the morning news and sketching and drawing would sometimes take takes uh i don't know from like five to nine hours each day, the rest of the day I would be spending, you know, messaging with people and kind of talking about everything else that was happening. And so the next morning I could begin that cycle again. Mm -hmm. Like there were two sides of the same process uh, in, in a way. Um, so I, again, I, I think there's maybe the element of that, that question about responsibility, but um, the different part of it, the difference in that whole experience uh, was also just acknowledging the absolute singularity of that moment in time. You know, I, I think, I'm not sure if I uh, was exchanging some thoughts with you, Russ, at some point, but I said this to a number of people. There, uh, one, among other things that made it kind of difficult for me to stop working on this project was the realization that I, I will never again find myself in that situation within this incredible convergence of so many urgent, important uh, moments, and weirdly finding myself in, in, um, in, in sharing that space with so many people uh, that, that, you know, somehow uh, opened up to, to that conversation, uh, were vulnerable uh, in that space with me. And, you know, that's, that's one reason why the project itself kind of oscillates between these very sort of direct messages that are sometimes acknowledging the, the, the you know, very critical loud voice, but also have these super intimate vulnerable pieces that you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. that that is the kind of uh, 
um, range of these conversations that would unfold. And uh, being honest about this was, um, yeah, really unlike anything else. I mean, it was a very, very unique, very singular experience. And it's a hell of a crossroads that we've been yeah. at and of what, four or five existential crises all at once, almost all of which we're still pretty much in. Um, right. Steve Dietz had a question to follow up on talking about Instagram. Um, and he said, Peter, I think that almost uniquely in your work with the COVID report, when you posted on Instagram, you also provided some personal commentary slash context for each image. Uh, why? Hmm. As opposed, I'm assuming, to sort of letting the image speak for itself. Yeah, I think that just acknowledging how important that part of it was, uh, to me, it was uh, in many cases the commentary or the captions that I would uh, uh, that I would post along with the images, they serve multiple purposes. On one hand, I would just thought about them as long form titles for the drawings. Um, so if, uh, and some of them really were just a couple of words, but most of them were like mini, uh, like a paragraph or a couple of paragraphs of text. So there was a, a bit of narrative happening, but I was really thinking about these as like long form titles, impossible titles. But at the same time, uh, they were also the proposition or the opening of that conversation because a lot of that dialogue did happen just right there in the Instagram, in the, in the comments that unfolded or something that I said in the message prompted somebody to message me and, and these conversations would unfold. So the drawings played that role, but the captions did too. Mm -hmm. So that was another very, very concrete, very real um, kind of uh, motivation to sort of stick with that with that format and continue the the writing and then um you know just the same way that a good title can uh sort of allow the audience to maybe notice something about the work or allow the audience to pursue one kind of interpretation of it or open certain uh points of entry in the work i was very much thinking about the this these extended captions as these entry points as well um an opportunity for me to say I know that on the surface, this thing looks like that, but just think about these things and then look back at it. Um, so there was a, um, it's interesting because um, now that the work is being exhibited in the physical realm, that's a question, you know, that is, that we are kind of grappling with, like how, is there a way to reconnect those narratives with those images or how to do it? Because Instagram provided this, that and the parallel world of the stories that offered the um, the the opportunity to share the process, share the videos, the sketches, and my yet like a third voice that that said, "So there's the drawing. Here's my official caption. You know, the set of thoughts that kind of uh, resonate with the drawing and kind of open up some possibilities. And then there's this other voice that just says." here's what I was thinking when I made this uh, mm -hmm. on, a, on a very kind of like logistical level, right? Or yeah. here's the historical references that you can find in the drawing and this is why they're there. Built in didactic kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, as a, as a teacher, I, th I feel like, you know, maybe there was the teacher part of me that, that felt that there's an opportunity there to uh, front the process and kind of uh, because, you know, I, when I describe this series, and I will honestly say most of the work that is in the exhibition in the book, I would say that these are all like attempts to, uh, I don't know, process, you know, process reality, make sense of, uh, of the world to, um, let's see, I have some notes here. Um, uh, what is this? Yeah, here. To witness, to process reality, to make sense of the world, to record. Um, those are like phrases that are very active um, kind of procedural things. So when I would post about sketches and drawing, I would literally say, this is how I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. But I want you to also develop a critical perspective on the world on your own. Um, so yeah. As an my, artist, the, I just really enjoy the nuts and bolts of like, oh, that's how he drew all of those, deep, you know, all the dots or whatever, you know. Right. The way that you would do your drawing and then use your tracing and do all that it was just uh, sort of a masterclass in draftsmanship, just sort of on the fly every single day. So I really appreciated that aspect of it. Right. Yeah. A lot of people did and, and would say things like, 
yeah, come for the drawings, but stay for the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's art for you. Um, so Pong had a question. He said, uh, when you look back at the COVID report posters, is there one or two that you would revise? Oh, interesting. I thought this was going for my favorite and I was just going to say, no way, there's no favorites. Right. Are there some that I would revise? Yes. Mm -hmm. Care to <laughs> elaborate or specify? Are we good? I don't know if I do. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, it's always like this. I mean, there are 225 of those. It's impossible to feel equally, uh, you know, c confident with all of them. And mind you, and this is really the, the kind of clincher in the, as an answer to this question is to say, none of this was done twice or, or, or anything like that. This one drawing is the drawing that I made. So when I put the ink to the, to the paper, that was a point of commitment that I couldn't back out of. If something didn't quite work out according to the plan, I had to alter the plan so that it could still work out in one way or the other. There's, there had to be some kind of, uh, uh, and, and I, you know, when we were talking about the sort of performance-like quality of it, that was part of it for me. Um, on one hand, I just didn't have the time. I couldn't start over because, you know, like the, there was not enough time in the day to, to make this happen. But on the other hand, I like that. I like the fact that I had to commit to something and take it all the way through um, and then just own it. Uh, so I feel good about the project as a whole. Um, I Good. said this. I said this recently that, um, and I kind of like that phrase. I feel like I did it justice, uh, holding it for as long as I did, and uh, looking back at what each individual component has to offer. Would I want to? Would the would the kind of like critical eye in me want to go back and fix things, move things a little bit? Oh yeah, it's would I can it be literally a stylistic I, thing, or a, or is it more? Like you want to tweak a drawing or you want to change a concept? No, it would have to be just uh, like uh, tweaking the drawing, um, you know, the, the commitment to a particular gesture or composition, you know, this, I could, I could literally take every single one of them and tell you, okay, if I were doing this right now, I would want to move this a little bit over. This is a little too much space here, or these two lines are a little too close. It bothers me that these characters look this way and, and the other. Not the ideas, not the not the concepts. Those are, are were so like uh, deeply rooted in the feeling of the moment that I couldn't possibly rethink that. Uh, you know that, and you know I have said this many times about the projects that I really felt um, with each. Uh, there's a point in the process with each one of those drawings where I felt like I had to check with myself and sometimes with others. Um, uh, about kind of the honesty of that of that image or or that drawing that that's been uh, such a um, I think important part of this commitment commitment is a good word uh, as a as a substitute for the responsibility that you were asking about earlier I felt maybe more committed to the folks that I was engaging with and um, and part of that commitment was staying true to you know that moment to myself being honest about it and saying and really communicating that um with as much accuracy as as i can i think you did pretty good <laughs> thanks uh, <laughs> so Thank we're you. almost out of time uh we have i think time for one more question and uh the top question is actually from dr mullen and i think it'll be a good way to kind of uh Put a little bracket around our entire conversation and she asks uh does we are working all the time also expand the definition of work hmm. i th i think that's sort of what i what i meant when i said that uh just acknowledging different kinds of labor uh mm -hmm. that um and you know this it's a huge subject to me anyway in in many ways but yeah. just the shift from the from the like uh, manual labor or the 20th century sort of for this model of labor to the 21st century, the shift from the proletariat to the cognitariat, one of my favorite words, you know, the, 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 the proletariat that works with their heads, you know, doesn't produce the goods physically. Um, 
or emotional labor or intellectual, all kinds of intellectual labors. Um, there's so many um, uh, uh, unique, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger conceptions of what the what what labor would work is that, um, you know, there's something really kind of cool that happened recently. Um, I think two weeks ago, there was a, a really great uh, article in New Yorker magazine about work. And, and I read this and I thought, oh my God, this is like a labor camp article because it literally said something like the about working all the time. I think that phrase was like the subtitle for the article. And it was about the our relationship to work and workspace had evolved in this country. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really profound, honestly, to acknowledge, um, I mean, thinking about even this, you know, the fact that we're all in our domestic spaces and, you know, am I really, am I working right now? I mean, I feel like I'm kind of working. Uh, uh, earlier, I was teaching my class sitting in the same chair and, you know, the, the one time bleeds into the other time and uh, it's almost impossible to separate the, the leisure and work time at this point. And certainly not by uh, delineating specific spaces that uh, are designed to, you know, cultivate these activities. Everything happens at home, which means that either we're working all the time or we're not working at all, <laughs> one, one or the other. Um, so, and then this week's New Yorker has uh, an amazing article about cultural revolution and its relevance to American, to moment in American history now. And, mm. and that too could have been a labor camp uh, story. And in fact, has been, I've done, I've studied Chinese history specifically the uh, cultural revolution with great detail a lot of these books behind me you know you see all these red spines that's like a giveaway this has something to do with like uh um, political history and chances are communist history is part of it hence the red spine hmm. um that's not to say that uh, the amazing book uh being read is uh, <laughs> part, of, part of the same uh, part of the same thinking, though I do want to, uh, just before we leave this, I want to acknowledge everybody who contributed to this book, and uh, mm -hmm. Matthew did a stellar job designing it, but gorgeous book. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, what, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, that there's some um, these amazing two stories that came up in, in New Yorker that mm -hmm. uh, I found kind of like, I was shocked because these ideas were communicated with such direction and focus and detail and i have felt these things uh, as kind of cr kind of crazy fringe thinking in my head you know like what does cultural revolution have to do with america but here we are mm -hmm. uh, in a moment where not only this argument makes sense it actually could be really useful for us to look back at what happened there and try to figure out how we can acknowledge um you know where we are right now and you know, I, I will, sorry, I, I can't help, but sometimes since I brought up the cultural revolution, there is this beautiful quote from Gao Xinjiang from the his book called One Man's Bible, where he says, it is very likely that when people have forgotten about it, it will make a comeback. And people who have never gone crazy will go crazy. And people who have never been oppressed will oppress or be oppressed. This is because madness has existed since the birth of humanity. And it is simply a question of when it will flare up again. Um, I love that quote. Um, I'm glad that it actually sort of made its way as one of the last things that, uh, that I have a chance to say. And partly because I read this quote at that same performance that, I, that we started the, um, the talk today with. Um, this, this, this short quote was part of the manure and poetry event at Wiseman in 2007. So I love the, the circle that we just drawn. And um, so Russ, that was the last question, correct? Uh, there's the a few more. I don't know that if we have time to do them justice, we could do a speed round if you want, if you want to oh, plow through. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm cool. Um, so uh, Chris asks, uh, regarding the parts of labor camp that offer a critique on capitalism, do you propose some form or practices of anti-capitalism or an antithesis to the way of contemporary life? Uh, we can't do like- <laughs> We got 30 seconds. What do you got? <laughs> no, no, um, <laughs> no, I can't. That's just uh, unfair. Um, right, Chris, slide into Peter's DMs and you guys can work that one out. I, totally um, true, totally true. 
I have said this at the end of a uh, number of, uh, of the talks that I had a chance to do around the COVID project. It says, and, and I would say, and it's 100% true. If you really want to ask me some uh, questions or carry on a conversation, just message me on Instagram. I guarantee you, I will answer your, uh, your, your question. You know, I started this as a routine, like uh, sticking to it religiously with the, with the project. And I just keep, I keep doing this right now. I, I feel like there is this um, important dialogue that is happening there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's amazing all the work that you do and the engagement that you had. And like I said, the community that you've built around this work. And um, it's been an honor to talk to you. Um, I wanted to see if uh, Katie wanted to jump back in and give- Hold it, anybody... hold it. I, I, need to, I need to acknowledge all the folks that were, oh. um, that made this book possible. So I was, I was thinking that I would maybe start the evening with this, but uh, the, you know, the, your question was so, you roped me right into it and I didn't have a chance to even collect my thoughts, but I, I, you know, I really do think that the book looks absolutely wonderful. And that's Matthew Rizak who designed uh, just a wonderful publication. And I, I said this to Matthew that I, I see his amazing uh, sensibility in this, in this book, but I also feel very much that it's, it, it feels like my work, you know, so somehow there is a, a, a kind of amazing ability to channel um, or to connect uh, the two sensibilities. So Matthew, the amazing designer for the book, and Rick, who photographed a lot of the the, the work um, that is presented in the book. I did want to give a shout out to uh, Karine, Ther Teresa, Emily, Michael, uh, the writers uh, for amazing uh, essays in the book. And of course, the Steve and Diane, who also wrote for the book, but whose kind of contributions go well beyond the scope of the book. Steve um, as a friend, uh, Steve Dietz as a friend and collaborators had been part of my, uh, this, this journey uh, through work for, I want, it's embarrassing to say, but it's been decades. And, um, and a lot of these projects simply wouldn't have happened if it weren't for Steve's support and um, both like logistically, but emotionally, spiritually in every, every aspect. And Diane, my goodness, I don't know how many times we have had a meeting about uh, the book or the exhibition. It's been, it's been an incredible uh, process. And I guess we still have a few ahead of us uh, uh, still coming up, but I'm very grateful for everything and um, for the way these things uh, materialized. And Eugenia, uh, uh, Eugenia for um, editing all the text. Thank you all for contributing to this uh, wonderful publication. I feel very proud uh, of it. And I just wanted to, to tell you how thankful and grateful I am for everybody's contribution to this, um, both the book and the exhibition, so. And thank you so much, Peter and Russ for this evening's talk. And to all of you in attendance with us, thanks for holding space um, and being reflective and staying with us throughout the event. Um, after the event, you all will be sent a survey and we would love if you would give us your feedback. It helps us create programs that are meaningful for you and that serve you, our community. And if you complete the survey, you'll also be entered to win a $20 gift certificate to the Wham Shop, where you can also order um, Peter's book. Um, and you can also stop in starting after February 11th during our new reduced hours, again, which is Thursday through Sunday from noon until five. Um, so thank you all. Stay hopeful, stay creative. And until next time, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks, Russ. That was yeah, great. Thank you, Peter.